Okay, good morning, good afternoon to our wonderful students and those of you who are interested in community nonprofit leadership. We're going to get our session underway here now. Uh, my name is Nick Deal. I'm a full-time faculty in the Department of Business and Tourism. I've been recently named the Program Coordinator for the Community Leadership Program. I am joined by an all-star panel of five panelists that have a tremendous amount of uh, experience in the community sector, and we're going to hear from them in a few moments. It is my distinct pleasure to introduce to you today our moderator, part-time faculty, Professor Betty Watsonborg. And Betty, I'm going to turn it over to you, and we look forward to the conversation. Great. Thanks, Nick. And thanks, everybody. It's very exciting to see all of the different uh, participants uh, join in all at the same time. So thanks for sharing your time at the end of a, actually a very beautiful spring-like day today. Um, as Nick mentioned, my name is Betty. And on behalf of the uh, MSVU uh, Business and Tourism Department, I'd like to welcome you, everybody, our students and our panelists, to this biannual gathering. This typically happens in the, uh, in the fall and in the winter. And as a non-Indigenous person and a descendant of settlers, I'd like to acknowledge and pay deep respect to the Indigenous people of the land from which we are hosting today's meeting. Um, appreciating we have people from, could be from all over the world in our audience. Uh, the Mount is located in the new Mi'kmaq, uh, the place of Mi'kmaq people. And I live and I work on the ancestral and seated and unsurrendered territory of the Mi'kmaq people. And I'd like to pay respect to the knowledge, the deep, deep knowledge embedded in the indigenous custodian of this land and to the elders past, present and future. And so it is with um, great delight to welcome our five panelists today. And just to uh, make sure everybody feels uh, comfortable about our process, we're going to do a round of introductions so uh, panelists, I have you listed by alphabetical order by your name, and we'll ask if you could spend up to two minutes um, with your name, your role, the organization that you are currently working with, and just a little bit of a bit about that organization. So our audience has a sense of the kind of the, the sector within the sector that you are engaged with. That will be sort of our opening round. And then we'll be doing uh, five or six rounds of questions in which um, I'll change whoever the first person is and the second and the third person. So everybody will have a chance to kind of go first and do the big reveal about whatever that answer is gonna be. And then chances are by the time we get to the fourth or fifth panelist, a lot of the things might have been said. So if you're kind of fourth or fifth panelist, if there's something else you'd like to add, um, but if you're feeling like, no, I think we've squeezed all the information out of that question, you can say, no, I think I'm good. Or you may have another insight uh, that's come up somewhere in the panel. So our, our goal over the next uh, 55 minutes is to draw as much of the incredible uh, wisdom and experience and insights that you have so that our students um, are able to learn as much about what um, a career in the sector is like, the diversity and scope of the types of um, services and programs and missions and mandates that each of you are doing in the sector and hopefully taking away some tips and tools about what they might be wanting to think about if they're interested in working in the sector. So that's how we're going to um, roll out our panel today. And so uh, without any further ado, um, I'm wondering, Alex, if you wouldn't mind unmuting and going first um, with respect to an introduction to yourself and your organization. Yeah, sure. Thank you so much. Um, first of all, I'd like to say thank you um, for inviting me to be on the panel. Um, it was a complete honor when I got the email from Betty. Um, our leadership program had such amazing people. Um, so to be asked to be on this panel, I'm so um, grateful. Um, also being called an all-star is like I've been called a lot of things, but I, I never got all star yet. So it's a lot of pressure. Um, my name is Alex McDonnell and I'm the executive director for Stepping Stone. Um, so Stepping Stone is a not-for-profit organization that works with current former survival sex workers and people who identify as being trafficked. We work from a whole holistic approach. So um, we meet people where they're at on their journey, whether that is um, on the, they're working on 
on the streets, um, a drop-in facility, um, and then a transition. Um, so I'm sure I'll probably talk a little bit more about Stepping Stone as we go, but that's um, me in a nutshell. Thanks so much, Alex. And yes, we will have, that's the purpose to draw as much out as we can through the next number of questions. All right, um, let's see, Amani, would you mind going next? No, I don't mind. Thank you very much for the opportunity. It is a pleasure to be invited to this platform. And uh, yeah, so my name is Amani Saleh. I am the Newcomers Engagement Specialist with Halifax Public Libraries. I, I filled this post a year ago. I am a newcomer to Canada myself. I've been here for two years and eight months now. I came here as an international student myself. So I got exposed to the education system here in Canada. So it's been an honor for me and such a wild experience here since I came here to Canada. I love it here and uh, my son came recently. My son is 27 and he's also, he also came as an international student. He's studying at Nova Scotia Community College. But I got to learn about the universities and uh, you know about the education system in general. So it's a pleasure for me to be here. And uh, yeah, I'm so looking forward to sharing my experience through the different questions that will be asked. And I hope that I am able to be of use to this panel <laughs> today. Thanks, Amani. Uh, how about Karen? Would you like to go next? Welcome, Karen. You mean me? No. Nope. Well, maybe. I don't know. <laughs> oh, sorry. It's about the similar. Sorry. Yeah. 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 We have we have Karen. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Very good. Yeah. Th thank you, uh, Betty. And thank you, Nick. And um, it's re really great to be in a classroom again. Uh, my name is Karn Nichols, and I'm the executive director of the Canadian Mental Health Association, the Nova Scotia division here in Halifax. And uh, I've, um, uh, I I'm really appreciating the opportunity to speak to you because um, Career services is a, is a space that's near and dear to my heart. I'll tell you a little bit more about that later on, but uh, there's a great connection between what I'm doing today and, and uh, maybe some of the conversations we'll have along the way today. I'm really looking forward to them. Thank you. Okay, thanks so much, Karen. And Lindsay, would you like to do your opening round of introduction? Absolutely. Thank you so much, Betty. And thanks to all the other panelists. Um, it's nice to be in such great company with you all. Um, so my name is Lindsay Corey. I'm the executive director for Nocturne Art at Night, which is um, Chibukta Halifax's Art at Night Festival, but we also do a plethora of programming throughout the year as well. Um, Nocturne was started in 2008, which makes us 15 years old this year, um, which is an exciting milestone for us, although it feels quite small in the grand scheme of things. It's uh, it's been exciting to go back and do a lot of archive work as well. Um, so we work with artists throughout the city and the province and also nationally. Um, and we use art uh, as a way to connect. So I'll, I'm excited to share a lot of the different programs that we have, but um, mostly just excited to speak with you all. Thanks so much, Lindsay, and welcome. And Selena, if you would like to close our opening round. Thank, thank you, Betty. So my name is Selena Gilbert. I'm actually a casework manager, non-executive director. I'm sitting in for my executive director today. Um, we are Community Justice Society, and we offer the Nova Scotia Restorative Justice Program. Um, so while we're not for profit, we are actually under the umbrella um, of the DOJ. Um, we offer the program to uh, adults, which was recently rolled out in 2016, and we've offered it to youth for um, a number of years. We are an alternative to the traditional justice system um, that we take in a relational approach to, to justice in the community. 
Thank you, everybody. And I've had the good fortune to know and work with all of our panelists. And I can't wait to hear all the amazing things that they're going to be sharing with us about their journey. I know we won't have enough time to draw everything out from everybody, um, but we're going to do the best that we can and to have a wrap at 530. So our first question is, building on the first one, is how what was your journey to come to actually working in the community and nonprofit sector and how has your education and experience or experience in education or one or the other um, led you to your current position and part three of that is how did you know the community sector was for you and so you could start with the end you could say how the community sector was for you and then whatever you feel comfortable sharing, sort of in the two to two to two minutes, two and a half minutes, um, whatever you feel is most important about your journey. And as I mentioned, in the spirit of uh, uh, changing the order, Amani, would you mind going first on that one? Yeah. All right. Can you hear me now? So, um, yeah, so uh, I am the newcomers engagement specialist, like I said, with Halifax Public Libraries. I'm pretty sure that everybody is aware about uh, Halifax Public Libraries and the kind of services that people would expect. So uh, when I first came here to Canada as an international student, I already had uh, a lot of experience in community work and nonprofit organizations from where I come from. I come from Egypt and I came here to Canada with like uh, more than 25 years of experience in different sectors, but all related to community work. So I was pretty aware about nonprofit organizations and uh, community work. And I came here, I, I first, uh, uh, I worked as a medical and legal interpreter for the newcomer communities here. Uh, I speak Arabic as my mother tongue and I speak English. So I got to learn, I thought I was coming to Canada. Uh, so it's a developed country, the systems here like would provide everything to the people in the community. And then I started to learn about some of the issues that actually newcomers face and Canadians at the same time. And then um, I, 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 the library was a place for me to study and do assignments and access the internet. And the first time I went to the library here, uh, there was a storm in 2019, and I had just came here a month before that storm, and Central Library was the only place that had power when the power was out, like in most of Halifax at the time. It was uh, Hurricane Dorian. So, uh, so this was the first time I went to the library, I accessed the place, and I got to learn about some of the services that are actually provided for newcomers or for people who are new to the communities uh, in general. And then through my work, um, I learned about the issues and then there was this announcement uh, posted uh, on Indeed actually. And I had finished studying at the time and I was looking for a job. So this was the job that when I read the job description, I thought that this was the perfect job for me. So I applied for the position. I wasn't accepted on the first round of interviews, but I was like, yes, at least they read my CV. And then they got back to me again for the second round of interviews. And then I, I, I got the position and uh, yeah. And I was amazed and started to dig, to dig deeper into the new ways that the library is always inventing to best serve uh, the different communities with according to the different needs in, in, in the different communities. We have 14 branches uh, of the library around HRM and every branch has its own set of programs that are designed and introduced according to the different communities and according to the different populations. So, uh, so, uh, so this is basically in a nutshell, 
giving you an idea. What well, the type of work that I do through my position is that um, I, I help out newcomers and I connect them to available resources. So I get in touch with the different service providers and I make sure that they receive the services that they require. And I follow up and I help with language barriers and I do citizenship education for the people who are interested to apply for their citizenship course. Uh, we have our ELL program, so uh, English language learning program for people who need to learn English, but we also have programs for like Canadians and uh, different age groups and uh, different services. So this is basically in a nutshell what my organization provides and what my specific position and uh, I myself can help with. Beautiful. Well, thanks, Amani. Thank you so much Thank for getting you. us started on this round. Uh, let's Thank see, you Karin, would you, Karin, would you like to go next? A little bit about your journey. For sure, yeah. Um, I'd like to say that I had my act together and I, you know, I started out knowing this is where I wanted to be, but uh, strangely enough, and maybe not so, because I think a lot of people experience the same thing. It's something that you stumble across as time goes on. And uh, often they say, you know, um, sometimes, you know, life is lived forwards, but understood backwards. And so my journey to this journey sector to this has sector been, has been, oh, I'm getting some getting feedback there. Yeah. Uh, my journey to this sector has been really um, uh, not linear, of course, and, and it never is. And uh, I essentially started out uh, in business. And I was uh, my first, the first part of my career was in business. Now, what was going along at the same time was the fact that I had grown up in a family that were uh, always in service of the community. So the, the nonprofit sector or the, the, uh, the you know, this, this area that we are working in now, that wasn't foreign to me, but it wasn't something that I ended up doing at the, sort of the, for the first part of my career. So I was in business for about 20 years and then I went back to school and I um, did my master's of business admin and uh, ended up doing consulting. And um, at that time, my um, career or my interest in the nonprofit sector, uh, I was able to spend more time there and supporting them. And I began to really see um, the intersection of where my business uh, um, experience and where the work was in the nonprofit sector. And uh, over the course of the next 10 years, I did a lot of volunteer work. And then when this opportunity became available, it was something that really spoke to me because uh, it was really that sweet intersection where my passion and my purpose sort of suddenly came together. If you had asked me 20 years ago if I was gonna end up here, I would have said, no way, I can't see that happening. But if you look back at all of the different skills and competencies that I uh, gathered along the way, it makes perfect sense why I landed here in terms of what I can add uh, to the organization. And the organization itself, uh, just in case folks don't know, Canadian Mental Health Association, um, basically we work with the community. We're non-clinical in nature, but we really support the community with uh, navigating the mental health system with through education and advocacy. And so there are a lot of elements in all of that role that tie back to everything I've done to date. And so it's been really interesting for me uh, to really connect those dots and, uh, and really utilize them to add uh, value to the organization today. So that's a little bit about how I ended up here. And I think the message for the folks that are in the room are that, um, you know, it's not a linear path and it's really about paying attention to, you know, what, what lights your fire, what gets you excited and, uh, and doing something about it from that perspective, so. Thanks, thanks so much, Karen, and really appreciate everybody um, as Amani and Karen have done taking a little bit to share a little bit more about your organization, because we have such a diversity of uh, organizations in the room today. And I know that that's of great interest to our audience to hear what's what's actually out there and what are people doing and what do they care about. Um, how about Lindsay, would you uh, like to go next in terms of sharing a little bit more about you and your journey? Yeah. Um... I share a lot of the same feelings as as uh, Karn in that, you know, I didn't think that this is where I would end up. I really thought um, I'd be teaching or I thought I would be somewhere in academia, whether it was behind the scenes or or um, kind of working on different projects. But 
I grew up in a family of teachers and of artists and actors and musicians and really, really arts focused. So it really makes a lot of sense that this is where I've wound up. Um, I, I moved to um, Halifax about 10 years ago now. And when I moved here, um, and in fact, when I first moved here, I moved to Canning, Nova Scotia, and I moved here from Montreal. And that was a very big adjustment to from a very, very uh, huge city to, you know, a town of very, very few. And I moved here for a job and um, found quite quickly a like really thriving arts community um, and just wanted to be a part of it and spent the first year of living here volunteering for lots of different organizations um, that spoke to me um, that really um, inspired me to get involved and inspired me to um, meet new people and get connected to how things happen out here. And through that, I found myself on the board of Nocturne for a long time and um, filling different positions throughout my time and, and also working in different organizations alongside that work and got to about five years ago and Nocturne was in a position to be looking for an executive director and I was in a position to be looking to be an executive director and it really, um, it was a bit of a, a an exciting time, but also very stressful for the organization and for me. Of I had put all of this time into really building up what Nocturne could be, and then also wanting to um, find a way where I didn't have to do it off the side of my desk anymore or off the side of uh, my kitchen table late at night. I really wanted to do it as a full time thing. Um, so. I was really grateful and fortunate when um, Nocturne chose me to be their first executive director, but certainly I won't be the last. And I, a lot of my role within the organization has been to grow it and to build sustainability into the, um, into both the role and the organization and try to make it a better opportunity for lots of folks to be involved and hiring new people and bringing new people into the system that I felt so cared for in. Um, so that is a little bit about me and a bit more about Nocturne. I, I think when I first came on, we were really focused on our um, one night art festival. That's still our biggest piece of programming. But in the last few years, we've really diversified a lot of different programs. We do a summer workshop series with um, newcomers and immigrants partnering with ISANS through that. Um, and that's really grown into something quite big. And even throughout the pandemic, it was exciting to see different ways that that project could, um, could provide a sense of um, introduction and belonging to um, the places and spaces that make up the arts community here in the city. And um, so I was really proud that Nocturne got to be um, a part of people's journey and coming into the city and, um, and seeing how they could actively change it too. Um, I guess that's it. <laughs> Thanks so much, Lindsay. Uh, let's see, Selena. Share a little bit about your journey. <laughs> so I too did not know that this is where I was going to land. Um, come next month, I will have been with the agency for 16 years. Um, I, I graduated um, looking for employment and kind of took off with an opportunity to the United States um, to work in youth care, which I worked there for four years um, and returned back to Canada. Um, also, got a job in youth care um, within the city and uh, then became pregnant. And so off of maternity leave realized I can't do night shifts anymore. I just can't, I can't do this. Um, and so started as a volunteer with Community Justice Society and very quickly the position had opened up. So I applied for that um, and was accepted. Um, into my first couple of years, the agency, um, at that point, we only offered the program to youth, so 12 to 18. Um, and um, we piloted a restorative options for youth and care program, which kind of hit home for me because that's where I spent a lot of my uh, time um, and 
passion um, in, in that field. So I became the caseworker for restorative options for youth and care and kind of made that my baby and worked for that for the rest of my time until 2016, when the program then um, rolled out and offered to adults. So that was brand new for, for us, for Nova Scotia. Um, and it was at that point where I then uh, went into the casework manager role um, because we needed somebody to help manage the whole new uh, number of referrals that we were going to receive. I should say that when we rolled out to the adult program, we are partnered with um, the government community correction. So we're a little bit of a hybrid um, in, in my role. Um, so since 2016, we've offered to, to adults. Um, and like I said before, it's an alternative to justice um, with a different lens at looking at repairing harm in community and with victim and those those who've been impacted by by harm um, that are not in the media. Um, it gives voice to community, it gives voice to, to victims, um, and it gives them the opportunity to tell people what they need to move forward, not for somebody to decide that this is what you need. You get to decide what you need and where you get to decide whether you participate in this process. It's voluntary for everybody. And so um, as a victim, that is a choice that you, you get in our program where you don't necessarily get in the, in the traditional system. Um, we are in the process of trying to transform justice. So it's been quite an exciting time. There's a lot of um, public interest files that are, are with the agencies right now um, that most people just think that it's for petty petty things. It's, it's not. It's most impactful for the highest harms, um, which is what people don't understand a lot of. Um, but that's what we, we spend our time doing, um, trying to make a difference and give community voice. Thank you so much, Selena. I'm, I'm hearing the trend that it's not linear. <laughs> and it's a continual journey based on what we've heard so far. And I also think we, there's a theme there that people um, were exposed to organizations or to the sector, either through volunteering or for act actively participating uh, as well. So um, those were a couple of threads and themes that I carried out of that first, uh, that second round. So we're going to broaden it a little bit, and I'm actually going to blend two, two um, questions together. So each of you are me. in your own, whoops. Forgot me. Sorry, with <laughs> oh, sorry, um, Alex, I'm so sorry. When I started with A, I'm so sorry. Go for it, okay. Alex, I'm sorry. I thought Just I had my check marks you want. <laughs> Thank you. I, and I can't see anybody on the screen other than myself. So thank you for jumping in. Oh, no problem. <laughs> That's my only child syndrome. I'll jump in if you yeah. forget about me. <laughs> yeah. Um, yeah, so I'm following suit. I was not linear at all. Um, I'm actually from Annie Ganesh, so my I had to go to St. Yvette's, um, or my family probably would have disowned me. Um, so I graduated, um, I was the eighth person to graduate from um, St. Yvette's from my family, um, and I had no idea what I wanted to do. Um, the only dean's list I made was uh, on prob probation and probably going to get kicked out if I didn't get my act together. Um, so there's that. Um, school was never my strong suit. It just, I can't sit still long enough um, to pay attention. Um, so I really didn't know where I was going to end up. And I think my family also had no idea where I was going to end up. Um, so I moved. Um, from Annie Ganesh to Halifax about 10 years ago and um, thought I was going to develop my career. Um, I graduated from St. of X with sociology, psychology, which um, coming to Halifax, a lot of people had the same qualifications as I did. I actually ended up working in a warehouse um, for my <laughs> living here. Um, I was the only girl wearing steel toe shoes, driving forklifts, um, and it obviously was not something I, I wanted to do um, as long term. Um, so I went back to school to become an addictions counselor. Um, and addictions has always been interested. I've always been interested. Um, and surprisingly, I graduated with high honors in that course. So I guess it had to be something that I was interested in. Um, after school, I um, got a job with uh, Crosby House, which is um, an addiction, a private rehab down in the valley um, that is very abstinence-based. It, it was one of my favorite jobs. However, um, 
abstinence doesn't work for in my world. Um, so I'm the very harm reduction kind of person. And that's how I ended up at, um, first of all, I was the executive director for the Hepatitis Outreach Society. And then I moved to Stepping Stone where um, it's probably where I'll, I'll end up for the rest of my life working there. Um, I absolutely love it because it's a wide range of things of helping people. Um, it's not just a one size fits all kind of thing. Um, and I always knew I wanted to help people. I just know, knew that I couldn't go to school long enough to be a psychiatrist or a psychologist. So, um, but that's how I ended up in the not-for-profit sector. Thank you so much, uh, Alex. And thank you for raising your hand and telling me my list was a little bit incomplete. So thanks everybody. I think we're also seeing um, that, uh, that there's a lot of opportunity for movement in the sector that we can start one place and then we can try something else and then we can go to another or we can stay in the same organization um, in either now or a lifetime and that we can also travel within organizations to different places could be different towns cities or even countries with organizations so because we have such a breadth of experience in the sector um, the, the next question could be in response to your own current organization, or it could be more of um, an external perspective on the sector in terms of what do you feel are kind of the top, I'm going to say top one or two challenges. So by the time we talk to five people, we'll have a big list of seven or eight challenges or eight, 10 challenges. What do you feel are the top one or two challenges that leaders such as yourselves in the sector are facing? So it's what are the challenges that really jump out for you? And on the balancing act, what do you feel are, what is the kind of one or two top um, either benefits or the things that keep you energized and fired up about being in the sector? So we have our challenges over here and then we have, a, this is the thing that keeps me going. This is the fuel that keeps me in the sector. And it could be from your own experience now in your existing organization, or it could be just a, a bigger, more holistic um, perspective about for leaders in the sector. So what do you feel there's top challenges and what is that fuel that keeps yourself going? And let's see, Karn, I'm going to start with you. Oh, that makes my job easy. I think um, it's been really super interesting for me because I've come from kind of the for-profit um, side of the world and, and sort of grown up and um, you know have that sort of paradigm in my bones and then going to the the um, not-for-profit um, side of the equation it's a different world uh, we still have a lot of work to do but it's a different world and and the way we go about doing that work is quite different and so for me the piece that really um, sticks out for me and I know I'm suspecting most folks in the room will say this it's it's the um, it's the funding. It's the, the it's the way we get our money. It's the and and what happens as you learn more and more. And I'm continuing to learn more and more. Is that um, the 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 way that the funding models are set up really don't support us doing our very best job. And what that means is that we will spend our time uh, applying for certain grants that uh, will dictate what kinds of projects we work on, even though we know there are needs somewhere else in the community. We have to do certain things because the money is tied to it. Um, and, and the other piece of it that I see, certainly with my business lens, and it really undermines everything we do, is that the, um, the, the fact that we have to keep going back to the well to, you know, get the funding again and again and again, which means a couple of things. Um, it means that sometimes when we hire, you know, superstars, um, you know, to work on our teams who are really passionate and want to do the work, the funding only lasts for a year and then we have to say goodbye to them. And then, you know, it comes back a little bit later on and we have to train some more folks. The amount of energy required to um, fund and, and get folks onboarded and running again, really, you know, at the end of the day, does a disservice to the community because we're always stopping and starting and stopping and starting and stopping. So our energy ultimately is spent in the wrong places. It's spent on surviving versus the good work that we have to do. So for me, that's the, that's the kind of the big boulder that really, um, I, I see really makes it difficult to, um, yeah, to do what we need to do. And I think the other piece is that, and I, uh, this is why I love these sorts of um, venues, is that sometimes the sector 
uh, isn't really well understood. And so in, in one of my previous gigs, I worked with career services and I would work with students who were in the business programs. And after talking to some of them, you know, um, at, at length, it would really become clear that they wanted to be in service in their community, but it would never occur to them that that could be a career because it was always, you know, um, it had a bad rep, you know, essentially, you know, it was, it was difficult, there was not a lot of support, and this is true, sometimes that is, but the upside of the reward to it is so much greater. So it's, it's uh, I think those two are two big things that really impact the space that we're working in right now. Thanks, Karen. And you probably named that probably number one that others might be naming. So for the rest of our panelists, what else would you like to add? What would be a top of mind challenge in addition to that funding piece that Karen so beautifully articulated? And what's something that keeps you um, energized, motivated, keeping going? So, and I'm conscious of our time. So let's go for Lindsay next. Lindsay, what would be your top one and one for those, that question? Yeah. Yeah, I mean, I share the same things that Karen is saying. Um, I think um, another challenge of leaders in the sector, especially over the last two years, has been burnout. Um, we've been really driven to these tiny screens and communicating with our boards and our committees and our uh, partners um, in this way when we used to be able to walk into their offices or host an event and gather together and share in their experiences. And I, um, I think every single sector within the nonprofit um, like overarching sector has probably really struggled over the last two years with that. But I think also the, the benefit to that has been the reach that um, is possible because of it. Um, especially for us, we've had people attend our events from both that probably would have never come just because of location, but also um, there's lots of other reasons that people don't come to events and they live right here. Um, and it made it more accessible for folks to attend. It made it something that you could do um, at home while you're cooking food is to engage with the arts. And so I think um, I think there's been costs and benefits to both uh, on both sides uh, with that challenge. And then I guess the second one that I would bring up um, is is really uh, a a challenge in um, in in sustainability in organizations, and I guess this is also about burnout a little bit. But I think um, we really try hard to to come up with new programs and to um, to make impact um, in different sectors and to you know be responsive to our communities, but that. Also, that churn of the work really requires um, a lot of human resources and they just kind of drift away. So I think um, that what Karn said is really true, that there's not a lot of sustainability built in the actual like economics and operations of, of organizations and a lot of <laughs> a lot of resources being thrown into projects that are ultimately going to drive a lot of impact. But, um, you know, it'd be great to have more sustainability in the organizations ourselves. Great, Lindsay, thank you. And thank you for bringing in the, the context of some of the positive things that have uh, resulted from the last two years. Okay, okay, so Selena and um, folks, I'm conscious of our time because we have another round of questions. Um, so what is one challenge you'd like to add to what um, either Karen or Lindsay has said and what's something that keeps you going that just really helps you in your day-to-day -day. and over to you, Selena. Um, so for us, it'd have to be resource support. We're, we're not funded for support for resources. So we are relying on community um, for those uh, supports for our clients. Um, and we all know that the community not-for-profit is at capacity. Um, and so it's a real struggle um, for us and, and sometimes a barrier. Um, what keeps me energized is um, seeing people kind of get it seeing the harm been repaired. We talk about it being um, magic in a circle that you can't really, you can't describe to people. You have to be there, you have to witness it. Um, and until you do that, you really, you don't, you don't get it um, as much as we would hope that, that you would as we kind of 
um, describe our program to people, but it, it's that magic and just watching it happen. Beautiful, thank you. Um, Alex, what else can you add in terms of either a, ch a challenge and what keeps you Moving yeah, forward. so I'm going to echo everybody, funding, burnout, all of the above, um, <laughs> but I'm also going to add working with a board of directors that doesn't know what they're doing, um, and that's not Stepping Stone <laughs> Board of Directors, just in case somebody knows one of them. They're actually one of the most amazing boards I had have the opportunity to work with. However, I've worked in the past with boards that um, just have no interest and don't know what they're doing, which um, is frustrating. Um, and, but what keeps me in the field is seeing the success stories, seeing people um, coming from off the streets to making a transition in, in their lives, um, just even giving them a new life. So um, that's what keeps me in the field. Great. Thanks, Alex. And Amani, what would you like to yeah. add? Challenges <laughs> and what keeps you going? Well, um, like I work for the government section and funding is also an issue uh, at times, but at least they have they have a yearly budget. So, so compared to other organizations, I cannot speak about funding really like them. Um, what keeps me going is uh, like seeing seeing that I'm actually able to make other people's life easier by settling down here and uh, reaching out to the different services that makes their life easier. So this is what keeps me going in my current job. Thank you, Manny. And I'm pretty sure, and Karen, we started with you on this round, right? <laughs> All right, we're gonna move to our final round and you'll, you can see I'm combining questions so I can try to get, draw as much out of our panelists as I can with each round. So this is going to be really specific to like workforce. So as you think about either the organization you're with now or other organizations you've been with before, what types of skills or attributes or um, training do you feel help candidates who are interested in working in your organization or in the sector stand out? So this is for students who are thinking about their, their skills, their experience, their education, maybe training. What are the what would be the top of mind skills that you think are important for potential candidates in the sector to be um, coming with or working towards so they 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 stand out? And Lindsay, I'm going to start this one with you. And if we can kind of keep this to um, kind of less than a minute, folks, because then we're going to do one final uh, one final round. All right. So Lindsay, um, what's coming up for you? What's the best advice you can give here? Yeah, I think at least in the arts and culture sector, which is where I really fit, I think it's quite wide reaching. I mean, you can have background in communications and in back, a background in community development or, um, or in art itself. Um, there's also, I mean, we do a lot of budgeting work. I've seen um, executive directors be that, come, come at the arts through that lens of really trying to, um, work through the financial challenges of the arts, but also um, really help to set more organizations up for success. I think that if you're looking at a career in, in the arts and culture sector, you could come at it from, I mean, truly any, any program. Great. Thanks, Lindsay, for keeping it wide open. Uh, let's see, Selena. Um, so for us, the biggest thing that stands out when we're looking for people um, is your ability to develop the relationships. Our program is all about relationships um, and you have to be able to demonstrate that ability. You have to be able to be empathetic um, with people and understand their situations while not being judgmental, um, but also being firm and having structure, right? So um, for us, that is is one of the top things kind of that that I look for and time management is of the essence in this field. <laughs> Did you say time management, was it? Yeah. <laughs> okay. <laughs> we could go, we could so many, go so many different places with that, but we won't have time. <laughs> so curious. Um, let's see, Alex, what's coming up for you in terms of the skills, competencies, training, education? What's um, feeling so most I, important? I know I only have a minute, so I'm not even going to touch base. Like school is great, and and but if you're not able to connect, I'm in the human services field. So if you're not able to connect um, with an individual, it's not really the field for you. Um, but also, um, 
the biggest assets to our team are the lived experience. Um, so people who have been there, who have lived it, who have, um, I've ne I have never been a sex worker, but half of my team have or have identified as being a sex worker. Some of them um, are recovering addicts, um, been incarcerated. So they're able to connect with our program users on a level that um, no textbook could ever teach me. Um, I'm not saying that the school is not important because it is. There are the other half of the team that, um, um, that were hired based on their education and stuff. But I think the most important is being empathetic and um, being able to connect with, a with the program users. Thanks, Alex and Amani. Uh, well, uh, yeah, so, so basically, if, if, if you like to interact, like working for the library, if you like to interact with people of different ages, if you're sociable, if you want to make friends, if you're willing to listen, if you like to serve the community, like you have to have the ability to connect with people, uh, like my colleague said, because you are one a member of a team all the time, like every day, and you deal with the public. Uh, like this is what we look for in, in volunteering at the library. We don't look for like education, not necessarily education for volunteering, but you have to be, you have to have the skills, these, uh, these social skills. Thanks, Amani. Whoops. Yep. Uh, I'm not unmuted. And Karen. Yeah, I, I would agree with what everyone said. And, and I think the thing that I come back to uh, time and time again, I think, um, who was it that was talking about, Alex was talking about lived experience and, and what I'm finding in this sector is that um, it attracts folks with lived experience. And so um, there, there's a certain skill set that is um, this capacity to meet people where they are. And I think that comes back to self-awareness, um, emotional intelligence, um, and, and those sorts of things. So I think that there's a piece of that there for sure, in addition to other, you know, the other sort of harder skills. The other piece that I would suggest is uh, what I really love about this sector is the awareness around social justice and, and you know, the pieces that feed into our systems. And so uh, what I'm noticing is it's really important for people to be um, aware of those things and the, and, and be able to connect the dots between what's happening in government versus what's happening on the front lines versus what's happening in our organization and be able to make informed decisions when they show up every day. And I think that's a really important piece of it as well. All right. Thanks, Karen. We're going to do a, we're going to do a speed round here because there was a lot of the social, emotional, intelligence, relational things that's really, really strong theme. Lindsay alluded to a number of different jobs that might have a number of different skill sets. So we're going to do a one speed round before we do our final question is what is one either hard, hard skill, technical skill, something that you might have to go get training on that you think has value that comp that, that you would need in your organization or you think would be needed in the sector. And so this is like a like like a one sentence or one breath word. So let's do one more round of more of the hard skills or technical skills to see what com what comes up. So let's see that I think that's uh, Selena. I think Selena's first on this one. Selena, what's okay. one specific hard skill? Um, understanding the justice system. Okay, simple, right? Yeah. <laughs> a lifetime skill. Perfect. Thank you. <laughs> Alex, what's coming up for you? What can you add to this list? Uh, understanding mental health. And yeah, understanding mental health. Okay. Uh, Amani, what, what can you add to this list? Um, understanding the concept of community work and how to contribute into the community. Okay, yeah, beautiful. Uh, Karen, what else is there? Uh, going back to mental health first aid for sure, and then tra trauma-informed care, I think is another approach that's um, definitely uh, key in making impact in the community. Okay. And Lindsay, what can you add? I think uh, knowing how to program with an anti-oppressive framework, uh, it's pretty key for all of our sectors. All right, thank you. And I'll just add for the record, um, accounting 
and financial acumen. It's always really great to have someone on your team that has accounting and financial acumen and can do can kind of do the three uh, three bottom lines. So you have your social your social impact bottom line as well as your financial bottom line. All right, folks, we're coming up to our last round. Oh, thanks, Lindsay, for adding a few more. Um, it takes it certainly takes a village of uh, experienced, skilled uh, people on an organization. So, what is the what is one piece of practical advice? Uh, for our audience of students who are in all kinds of different um, phases and stages of their academic journey and a whole diversity of programs and, uh, that they're working in and learning in. And so what is one piece of practical advice you'd like to share with um, our, our learners today as they consider heading into, potentially heading into the community sector as a profession or a career? And let's see, Alex, we will start with you. And this is the one minute or less, folks, so we can land at 5.30. I can go fast. I have two things. Um, one is um, a lot is in this community is who you know. Um, so I really recommend maybe volunteering, um, reaching out to other organizations that you're interested, get your face out there, getting your name out there. Um, because if you make an impression, jobs come up, you might re get reached out or people might reach out to you. Um, and knowing the, what resources are around. Um, if you're in the not-for-profit world, you can't do any everything. Um, as much as you try. Um, so you need to know the other resources that you can connect with and build upon to help um, benefit your the person that you're working with. So that would be my two things. Thanks, Liz. Uh, Alex and Money, what would you like to add to this list of uh, practical advice for people that are considering going out into the workforce? Community sector. Be, be open all the time for change because you'll have change happening all around you all the time. You're starting your careers in whatever you have a passion for. So be open for change and don't be like too stiff, be flexible. <laughs> Great, I love that, be stiff. Don't be stiff, be flexible, <laughs> all right. Um, Karen, what would you like to add to this last round? I think uh, it really starts with uh, knowing yourself. And so before you actually head out into the market to, you know, figure it out, spend a little bit of time, quiet time and getting to know who you are. Think about those times when you felt pure, pure joy or you were in flow and you just think, I just want to do more of that in life and name it and then go out and look for more of that. Um, and then it becomes trial and error. As you meet people who are sort of working in that space, you learn from them and you say, hmm, I don't like that part, but I do like this part. I'm going to learn more about this. And that's how you sort of iterate. It's, it's, um, it's a very strategic approach, but it's well worth it. I think there's so much noise in our worlds that it's hard to hear what's in our hearts sometimes. And I want, I think it's really important to spend that time and dedicate it and invest in yourselves to do that first and then take an iterative approach from there. Thank you, Karen. Lindsay, what's coming up for you? I think echoing, go get out there, meet people. It really matters that you show your face at events <laughs> now that things are opening up that you're there and you've, um, you're a part of it. But I think also on the other side is be open um, to organizations you might not have seen yourself in before and not to burn bridges along the way too. You know, remain, remain interested in what people are doing and learning about it and then, um, you know, seeing how you can fit in and um, being part of it with them. Right on, thanks, Lindsay. And Selena, closing thought on this one uh, so Amani said it well passion and so this not-for-profit world is hard it's hard work um, and you need to love what you do in order to stay in this work um, and so that's what I would offer is find what you love and then you'll you'll, you'll stay right, right on yeah and I think as we've learned there are 6,000 nonprofits in Nova Scotia alone <laughs> so there's no shortage of organizations to get to know so um, in closing uh, to our audience, uh, we would I would love to use the chat as you think about what you've heard from this incredibly uh, knowledgeable and skilled and very passionate group of panelists. What is something you're taking from today's panel that uh, you either found interesting or you found new or you're curious about? And so let's just take an opportunity in closing to, um, let's do this waterfall. For those of you that are in my classes, you know waterfall. 
don't post anything yet. If you can just take a minute to think about what you're something that you're taking away from today's session that was either interesting or informative or is keeping you staying curious. And then we'll do a waterfall. We'll post all at the same time. So let's just take a minute. And when I say minutes, literally a minute. Using the chat, something you're taking away that's standing out for you from today's session with these amazing people. Betty, you can share my email address to anybody if they have questions. Yeah, yeah. Actually, Alex, can you put it in the chat? Yep. Okay, that way, anybody who picks that up. All right. I'll just take another 15 seconds so we can take away some highlights from today's session. Thanks, Alex. All right, let's do a countdown from three and two and one. Let's see what people are taking away from today's session. So using the chat, let's post. Thank you. So uh, just in wrapping up everybody on behalf of the Mounts um, Business and Tourism Department, thank you to our amazing panelists who when I reached out to them, they got back to me and said yes, really, really quickly. So thank you for sharing your knowledge and your wisdom and your experience today and being real a part of this career, um, career week because all the other departments are doing uh, career panels as well. It's definitely a win-win for our students to hear from such a diversity of people. So this it has been recorded as we know, and it will get posted um, somewhere on the Mount site. And for those of you that are in my classes, I'll post it on your Moodle. So you have a chance to listen to it again um, and hear about everything that amazing people have said. So take care, everybody. Thanks very much and stay safe and warm. Take care. Bye for now. Thank, Thank you. you. Thanks everyone. Bye.